I'm glad that you're here today. Welcome to Praise Center, here and online. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I'm glad that there's people here and online. It's more than just the people around us that are joining us for worship this morning. And throughout this week, people will be watching this message. And it's an important one today. It's part six of the Real Faith series that Pastor's bringing to us today. Real faith versus fake faith. You know, some of you ladies, you'll be able to pick out a fake purse. You know, oh, it says, it says Gucci, but it's only got, you know, it's like G-U-C-H-I. You know, that's not real. Or guys, you know uh, if there's uh, like some, some quality work clothes that you're looking for and you're like, yeah, uh, this lasted a week and my shoes are falling apart. It's fake. Well, the same thing with faith. There's a lot of times that we can fake our way through, but God is not pleased with that. So today, Pastor is going to share with us five ways to determine if we're, our faith is real and give us a couple examples of men in the Bible whose faith was real that we can look to as examples for us. I'm looking forward to this message today, and I hope you are too. Please welcome Pastor Ray. Thank you, Pastor Terry, and again, good morning to everybody, and I'll ditto that. Welcome online, and welcome in the house. Uh, you know, I'm going to be very glad when we can greet each other once again. <laughs> I, I miss that part of our service. It's, it's like, a, it's, it's an important part of just, you know, being able to share the love with one another, and uh, I'm confident one day it will be back, so uh, anyhow. Well, uh, Pastor Terry said it well. Uh, we've been looking at real faith, real faith, faith in, in how it plays itself out in our lives. And I said a few weeks ago that, you know, if it doesn't work, it's not real faith. But uh, growing our faith is an important thing for us uh, to do. And typically it happens over time. And typically it takes a little effort for our faith to grow. Um, I don't think any of us wants... To, to be the same tomorrow that we were today or the day after. I think every day we want to be growing in the Lord somehow. And our faith is one of those things that we want uh, to grow. So I'm going to share five truths and then two examples, all basically taken from uh, the book of James, which was written by the brother of Jesus, half-brother as some say, but brother of Jesus. And uh, the interesting thing about James to me is that he was not a believer early on. You know, the, the family was not really behind Jesus there for a long time. It's like, yeah, you know, he, he's come, he came up in our house. He's just Jesus. He's, and, but, but when the resurrection took place, that's when James really jumped on board and said, wait a second, something is different here about the brother that I knew and uh, what has happened to him since the Holy Spirit descended on him. So he has written a book. Just, what, what was it, 108 verses, some, something like that. Just a few chapters. And it's to encourage a church that was no longer able to be together. We know what that feels like to a little bit. But they were really spread out and separated under the fear of death uh, because there was great persecution in the Christian church. And so he's writing this to help keep them on track, to grow their faith, and to make them stronger through a difficult uh, time. Now, I'm going to talk about real faith versus fake faith. And I do want to say, I feel like I need to say this, I think Praise Center is ahead of the curve on this. I think Praise Center, as I've just watched over the last 21 years, uh, Praise Center, their faith, your faith playing out in real life, uh, it's very impressive. So this is either going to reinforce you. You're going to say, oh, yeah, it's worth it doing what I've been doing, the sacrifice of helping others and doing things. It's worth it. Glad I did it. Glad I went on the mission field, Diane. Glad I did what I did. Or maybe it'll, you'll say, wow, I need to do a little more here. Uh, but either way, I think it's going to be good for us to take a look at this particular idea in James. As Pastor Terry said, you know, there's, if, if there's a real version there's a fake version, okay? 
Have you ever noticed cars that mimic uh, exotic cars? You'll look at a common name car and you'll say, is that, is that a, is that a uh, Mercedes? Oh no, it's not a Mercedes. I, I gotta be careful naming names here. But you've seen it where they copy you know, uh, a, another car that's very expensive and it's not like it's a fake car, it's a real car, but it's not whatever they're copying. How, how about a Rolex watch? You know, Rolex watches are really expensive. I bought one. And Jody's never let me forget it. We were in another country where they were selling Rolex watches really inexpensively. And I remember saying, I said, is this a real watch? And the guy said, yeah, that's a real watch. I said, wow, this is a real watch. I'm going to buy this. It's a Rolex. A week after I got it home, it stopped working. <laughs> And Jody's never let me forget that. But I didn't, I didn't spend $15,000 on it, but it wasn't a very wise purchase. There's fake watches. There is fake hair. Yeah, I know about that. But don't laugh, there's fake nails. <laughs> fake teeth. Fake all kinds of body parts, you know, you, you, name it. There's fake tanning. John, I thought I'd hear a little something there. <laughs> he entered a bodybuilding competition, and, and they do that, okay? So, but we've got pictures. There are no pictures of the Rolex. <laughs> There's fake meat and fake cheese. There's fake sugar. There's fake designer clothes. That was another thing I saw when we were on this trip to another country. Uh, they were selling, what, there's a jacket that has this swish thing on it, and they were selling those. They were pretty inexpensive, leather, leather jackets. And I thought, man, they really sell them a lot cheaper here than back home. And then I, I heard a noise. <laughs> And uh, there was a curtain, and, and it wasn't pulled all the way closed, so I took a look. And there was a lady in there sewing those swishes on those, on those jackets, all right? Uh, fake leather, fake news, fake identities, you name it, there's fake. There is also fake faith. But one thing we need to be real is our faith. Now, you may not care if your jacket is authentic or not, your sweatshirt's authentic or not. You may not care about all that kind of stuff. Uh, it, you know, that, that doesn't matter all that much as long as you know what you're getting into, but your faith has to be real. It needs to be the real thing. We need real faith in, in, in a real God, and, you know, there's like thousands of promises in the Bible, but we need faith to believe those promises so they make a difference in our life. So do we have that faith to believe that the promises that God gives us are real? A fake faith has no power to change us to change our lives from the inside. It doesn't have the power to save us. Fake faith doesn't have the power to answer our prayers, so uh, to transform us to, into what God wants us to be. So we need real faith. And it's in the book of James that we give a little bit of an idea of what that might look like, um, the faith that can save us, the faith that can answer our prayers. We get an idea in James chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to read a little bit of uh, God's Word here this morning, found in James 2. And then we're going to talk about that for a little bit. So it's in James 2, verse 14. Go, find Hebrews and turn right, okay? You'll be right there. And the title in this Bible says, Faith without, without works is, help me, dead. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Uh, by the way, the, the word save can be used a lot of different ways, and the way you interpret it is how, is how it is in context. This does not save as in salvation, okay? It, that, that's real helpful to know that. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also, by faith, if it does not have works, 
It's dead. She's dead, Jim. Star Trek, sorry. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith has been, was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was it not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So I don't know if we have this graph, but I, some of you may have listened to it and said, well, it sounds like James is contradicting Paul. Because Paul says, you know, you're only saved by faith. It's only by faith. There's nothing else. But they're not contradictory. You have to understand the context and what it's really saying. So let me just contrast Paul and James for you for just a minute. The emphasis was Paul was how to know I'm saved. I am saved by faith, period. Saved by faith. James uh, I'm sorry, Paul was how to know I'm saved. James was how to show I'm saved. So how do I know I'm saved? I know it by faith. How do I show I'm saved? Well, I, I, there's a result of it. The, the focus of Paul was the root of my salvation. That's a little small up there for you to see, but it's exactly like I gave it to Terry. So. Focus is the root of my salvation. How, do, how am I saved? What's that all about? With James, it's what's the fruit of my salvation? What's the product of it? What, what, what is the outflow of it? One's internal and it's unseen. The other is external and it's very visible. And in Paul, he was really interested in, in you know, keeping Jewish laws. How do they line up? You know, when Paul kind of got away and after he had this experience with Jesus on the road and he got away, and one, of the, one of the things he really needed to do was he had to take what he knew so well about the Old Testament and what it said and how the predictions of the Messiah and the Jewish customs, traditions, festivals, laws, the prophets, all of those things. And he had to now reconcile that with his own experience with Jesus. So he is saying, okay, these laws fit in here. That's all part of it. But James is like, you got to live like Jesus. There needs to be a result of that. It needs to be, be there needs to be a difference here. So Paul's talking about salvation, and uh, James is talking about how a sinner becomes a saint. It's a different uh, emphasis. James is talking about how a saint brings heaven down to earth. That's uh, what I want to say there. So I want to go through four things that faith is not. Four things faith is not. All right, so we're going to look. Sometimes it's helpful to say, Here's a tr this is what's true, and then to say, this is what's not true, to contrast them. And uh, it's helpful in understanding. <clears throat> so Wednesday night, we, we looked at Judas, I think, in an interesting way, maybe a way I haven't actually thought of it. But J.D. Greer said Judas was a, kind of a normal person. <coughs> He wasn't outrightly some evil person. He was well respected as one of the disciples because he was given the purse. He was in charge of that. And, and everybody respected him in that position. Uh, he walked with Jesus, was called by Jesus, Jesus, chosen by Jesus. So, but there was something that happened along the way that caused a problem. Number one. Real faith is more than just words I say. Real faith is more than just words I say. Dear brothers and sisters, this is what we just read. Dear brother, who's he speaking to? Brothers and sisters, who's that? It's the Christians. 
It's the followers of Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, not speaking to somebody out there, but to our own. What's the use of saying, speaking it, faith is more than just words I say. What's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. So you ever met a person that sounded like a, a believer? But then when you saw him in action, you said, something's not right here. You ever, you ever seen that? You know, we, we make this mistake, and we, every celebrity uh, that, you know, says, uh, yeah, I just want to thank God or God has given, that doesn't mean they're a Christian. It doesn't mean they're not a Christian, but it doesn't mean that they are a Christian. Every sports star, if they do something, is, and it's, it's not, it doesn't mean it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it either. Um, if they vaguely sound like they're Christian, we want them to be, but that doesn't mean that they are. You have to look at their works. Country Singer Awards. And I just want to thank the man upstairs. Well, is that the sound guy? Who's the man upstairs? Who is that? Who's the man upstairs? The producer? Um, so... Just because you say something doesn't mean that that's who you are. You can say anything. So I don't like to put any celebrity on a pedestal. They need time like Paul needed time. You know, Paul did a little bit of teaching here and there, but basically for several years, he went away and reconciled everything. He, he had to figure out from here uh, to here. Judas... You know, I'm one of the guys. Yeah, I'm one of the disciples. I'm a follower of Jesus. Yay. I'm, you know, we're in this, and this is great. I'm one of the team. You can say whatever, but what you do tells a lot about who you are. Not everyone who says that I'm their Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. The only people who enter the kingdom of heaven are those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to to do. You know, I could say that I'm the best dancer in the world. Now, now I'm preaching it, right, Mac? Yeah. And Bud, you nailed it. Yeah. The minute I'd started dancing, you would realize <laughs> it's not true. So it's the works tell you something. So it's got to be more. Real faith is more than just words that I say. Secondly, real faith is more than just an emotion that I feel. Oh, I feel. Oh, well, emotions are good. They're part of who we are. They're part of how we're wired up. Nothing wrong with them, but that doesn't necessarily, that's not a necessarily a strong indicator of faith. The loudest person isn't necessarily the person with the most faith. You can be inspired. You can get inspiration. You can be emotionally moved. Oh, I just love that song. Just love that song. Um, <clears throat> you know, that song gives me goosebumps. What about it gives you goosebumps? Is it a connection that you made with Jesus somehow? Did he reveal himself somehow to you through it? Or was it the music? I got goosebumps listening to Faith Hill once. That doesn't mean that that was a religious experience. I just liked her voice on a certain song. Suppose you see, you know, and by the way, Judas had some emotions, didn't he, that revealed some things. Judas had some emotions. You used the oil and wasted it? You anointed him with oil? Do you know what that's worth? We could have used that. We could have used that to help the poor and to feed my pockets a little. We could have used it. Motions. They don't always tell you the truth either. Suppose you see a brother or sister who needs food or clothing, and you say to them, I wish you well. I feel for you. <laughs> Emotion. I feel for you. And I hope you stay warm and eat well. But when you do nothing to meet their needs, what good does your sympathy do? It's worth nothing. In the same way, faith, if it is not accompanied by action, doesn't work. It's dead 
it's useless. Now again, proud of Praise Center, the missionaries we support, PADS, Servant's Heart, Salvation Army, some of the things that we support just locally. If I shut my finger in the door, you know, my, my oldest son, I, Jody, I don't remember where we were when Raymond got his finger slammed in the door. I think we were in Wisconsin. And uh, we were at a little office complex, and I had walked ahead, and I heard screaming. And his finger was stuck in the door. Now, if I had walked up to Raymond and said, man, I really feel for you, Raymond. <laughs> now, that's... That looks like that hurts. That hurt? That, that looks terrible. Wow. Um, you know, we wish you well. And I <laughs> hope, you, hope you get over that. What he needs at that moment is what? Get my finger out of the door! <laughs> <laughs> now... Thank the Lord for those rubber gaskets <laughs> because they compressed really well and uh, there was no permanent damage, but uh, he was pretty little then. Scared him, scared us. So faith is more than words that I say. Faith is more than just emotions that I feel. There, there's nothing wrong with words. Let me just make sure I'm clear. Words that I say aren't necessarily wrong. And emotions that I feel are not necessarily wrong wrong. Here's the third one. Faith is more than an idea that I debate. You ever met somebody that just likes talking doctrine, theory, uh, ideas? Um, it's an intellectual game. Um, it's a mental challenge, uh, a theology to be studied, doctrine, dogma, idea. I, uh, I taught school with a uh, a fellow teacher like that. <clears throat> He's a big German guy. He couldn't say Mitchell. He would say Mitchell. <laughs> hey, Mitchell, what do you think about Dante? <laughs> hey, Mitchell, what do you think about... Because he knew I was a Christian. And so he wanted to debate everything. He wanted to... He was, just, he was a historian, and he was good. He was a philosopher. He taught... Those were what things he taught. Uh, we're, not, we're busy. Those were things that he taught. And he wasn't interested in salvation. He just wanted to debate. He loved the intellectual study of it. There are some people that come to churches that that's what they want to do. Um, you know, it's like the pin on the, how many angels can you put on the, on the, the, pin, the, the point of the needle? And, uh, you know, it's just debating things. But it's not really about a relationship with Jesus, understanding who he is, becoming more like him, and allowing him to change us from the inside. It becomes an idea that I debate. James 2.18. <clears throat> Someone may argue, isn't it possible that some people have good faith while other people do good deeds? But I say, no. I can't see your real faith if I, do not, if I don't do any real deeds. Show me, in contrast, then I can show you my faith by the good deeds that I do. Show me. I can show you probably a couple of the important words here. Uh, you know, it's more than just discussing ideas and endless debate. And again, this like the other ones. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. We encourage you to get... Bible knowledge, as much as you can. Um, understand, read, study. What does the Bible say? Study to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. We are to study, but there's more than that, and there are works that attach to that that help us understand if what we have is real or not. Um, Faith is odorless, colorless, and weightless. Kind of like calories. 
You can't really see a cal- I can't see a calorie. Can you see a calorie? I can see the results of them. <laughs> we can see the results. We can't really see the calorie very well. I know there's calorie counters and all of that kind of thing. But you can't really see it. What you see is the result of it. You judge by the result of it. How many remember the invisible man? Wow. I can judge your age by if you... <laughs> Diane, you're a late adopter on that. She's like, I'm not sure I'm admitting it. (laughs) Remember, you couldn't see the invisible man. Why? He was invisible, yep. You couldn't see him, but you could see where he was. How could you see where he was? Well, you'd see footprints when he's walking. You'd see his footprints, or you'd see something. You'd, You'd see a door opening and closing. You'd see the results of... The fact that he had been there or had done something, but you couldn't actually see him. So faith is a little bit like that. So we can see the results of faith in our lives. If any man be in Christ, any man be any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away, the new has come, and everything becomes new. So, it's more than words I say, more than an emotion I feel, more than an idea I debate. Um, It's more than a truth that I believe. Number four, James uses a bit of sarcasm here. Now you say, well, I believe there is a God. And I say, good for you. Even the demons believe that. And they're afraid of it. It's foolish to not realize that faith in God is useless if you don't do what he wants you to do. I believe there's a God. Yeah, good for you. Even the demons believe that. You know, I I hear a lot uh, people say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. But it's what that means that is what's really important. Because the devil believes in God. You know the devil is not an atheist? He believes in God. But he's not following him. You're not going to find him in heaven. But he believes in God. You know the demons believe in God? They, they believe in God. But you're not going to find him in heaven. So it's one thing to have this head knowledge about something... But not obey God, not love God, not serve God, not really understand and trust God. Of course Satan believes in God. He believes in God. Why did he want to kill Jesus? Because he believed he was God. He understood it perfectly well. Well, let's go to number five. Real faith is something I do. A commitment, a choice, an action. Just as a body without a spirit doesn't breathe and is dead, so faith that doesn't do anything is dead. A word that Jesus, uh, that James uses over and over again is the word do. Do. Very action-oriented. Do. If you do nothing, what good does your sympathy do? Faith in God is useless if you don't do something. So it's an important word in his vocabulary. Stand firm in your faith, stay brave, be strong, and do everything in love. I want to give just a couple examples because James uses these two um, at the end of uh, those verses that we read. He says, if faith in Abraham followed God, Abraham followed God in faith, not knowing where he was going. Abraham was from down here, Ur of the Chaldeans. Can you see down here okay? Yeah. Um, Modern day Iraq. He was from down here. God called him. He wasn't there weren't Jews yet. I mean, he was just Abraham who lived in this area. 
And God calls him and says, I want you to go to the land that I'll show you. Now, what would be your first question if God says that to you? <laughs> exactly. Where is this land that I'm going to? Start moving and I'll show you. Now, look, when a politician says you can't see something until you vote on it, that's different. <laughs> then when God says, I want you to move and I'll give you the plan as you go along. There's a big difference there, okay? God says, I'll show you. But you need, to start, you need to move out. And so Abraham, besides his, his son and the sacrifice and all that, from the beginning, he followed God. God said, he didn't know, he didn't have any idea where God was going to take him. Just want you to pick up everything and go. Now, look, if God doesn't tell you to do that, don't do that. All right? Matter of fact, it's good to have a couple people verify you say, I think God's telling me to sell everything and do this. Ask a couple people that are respected Christians what their opinion is on that, or to at least pray with you about it. I've seen people go off and really get themselves messed up because they'll take a scripture like this. God spoke to Abraham, but God didn't speak to them, and they go off and do something that God hasn't told them to do, and as a result, get in trouble. But Abraham followed God without knowing where God was leading him. That's real faith. And how do we know? Because there was action. How do we know about it? We know it because he took an action. He did something. We say, yeah, he moved. He went. He did. We see it. It's reported. He didn't just say, well, Abraham has faith. He did something. It's obvious that faith and works are yoked partners that faith expresses, expresses itself in works, that the works are works of faith. That's from James 20, verse 22, and then next verse. God accepted Abraham's faith, and that faith made him right with God. So Abraham was called a friend of God. He followed what God called him to do. Here's the other one that James used. Uh, in this particular scripture, Rahab. Remember Rahab? Remember the spies? You know, the, the spies are going in. They're going into the walled city. They're trying to find the vulnerabilities. They've been, their, their existence has been questioned. Like, we think there's somebody, there's a couple guys moving around here. We think they might be spies. And they end up being hidden by a prostitute named Rahab. Not a Jewish person. Not uh, you know, anybody high up and poor, but she, she concealed them. She took an action, and as a result, she's included in this faith, um, this, this discussion of what real faith is really about. By the way, she is included in some of the genealogies. Her name is in there. Uh, they didn't say, oh, she was a prostitute. We better not, better not. Better not put her in there. If your background is not stellar, realize you still can be a great person of faith. God can still use you. Follow him and do what he says. So she risked her life. You know, the story went on and they, they, marked, they marked her place so that when the Jews attacked that she wouldn't get hurt, her family and all of that. And so, but it was her faith in, in the God, in the God of the Jewish people that saved her. And it was the action that, they, that she took that showed that uh, to everybody. There's a story about a tightrope walker back somewhere in the 20s. His name was George Blondin. Uh, it's interesting to look this guy up. He was the one that went across Niagara Falls. Can you imagine putting a rope of tied hemp together, stretching it across Niagara Falls? You know, the winds are pretty good there. Uh, they got pretty good winds going over that water. And, uh, and he would take his little stick and, and he'd walk. Anybody here would try that? 
Oh, Bud would. Um, <laughs> no way. He did that, and then he would, he would go across, and then he, he would come back again. He went across with a guy on his back. His manager, I think it was his manager. He went across with a guy clinging to his back, and he said, look, whatever I do, you do. If I move, move with me. If I move this way, don't you? It's like riding a motorcycle, and you're on the back. You got to move, move with the guy that's driving the thing. Whatever they do, you do. If they get up on the pegs, you better get up on the pegs, too. You do what the driver is. You follow him. And, and, and he went across, he went across um, on a tightrope, Niagara Falls. Well, he went across. One thing he did was he took a wheelbarrow, loaded it with rocks, <laughs> and he rolls a wheelbarrow across on this tightrope. And one guy was so impressed, he said, you're incredible. You're fantastic. Never seen anything like it. You're the best. I think you could do anything. I think you could do that a hundred times. You're just an amazing person. I just believe in what you're able to do. And the guy said, really? He said, yeah. So Blondin took the wheelbarrow, dumped the rocks out, and said, get in. <laughs> Faith without action doesn't show you the same thing. I think it's a challenge to us. Um, for those of you that missed Wednesday night, let me, let me just pause here. You know, Judas had choices to make. Peter, one of the things that J.D. Greer kind of contrasted was Peter and Judas. Judas messed up. Peter messed up. Matter of fact, all the disciples ran. They all ran. They were all scared to death, didn't know what to do. Um, all their actions were like, really? You believe in him? And Peter, who was the big, loud, boisterous one, who said, yeah, even if everybody else falls away, not me. Yep, I'm like the best of these guys. These guys are like peons, but not me. I'm the guy. I'm the man. And Jesus said, no, no. You'll deny, you're going to deny that you ever knew me. More than once. And you remember when he was out around the fire, and the lady said, you're one of his. You're one of his followers. I can tell by your accent. You're one of his. And he says, no, no. And he actually swore. I mean, he swore. Um, uh, his actions were not so good. And that tells you, those actions tell you where he was. And the actions of Judas tell you where he, where he was. The difference is Peter repented. He felt more than felt bad. He repented. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me more than these? And there's, there, it's an interesting conversation. I, I'm not going to reiterate it, but, um, but Peter repented. Judas did not. Peter had humility. Judas did not. Peter wasn't so much looking out for himself as Judas was wanting money and power. And he wanted Jesus to come on the big white horse and reigning. But there's a big difference in how they ended up. But it was the actions, that's what I'm trying to get to here, the actions that told where they really were. As I said in the beginning, I think for many here, many watching, that this will reiterate to you that many of the things that you have done, helping others, helping one another, letting your faith have actions when you're with your families and so on, that you're doing a lot of good. For some, it will be a challenge to say, you know, my actions fall really short of the things I say and the emotions I feel and those other things. And, and I need my actions to reflect more of who I want to be and even who I say that I am. And I want to pray about that as we conclude our service today. Would you stand with me?
Let's bow our heads together for a moment. It's everybody eyes closed for just a little bit here. And if you say, by, by raising your hand, you know, my actions aren't lining up like I, like I know I want it to be. Would you pray for me, Pastor? And I'm going to do my best to allow God to make some changes in my life. Would you just slip your hands up right now? Yes. Yes, all over the room. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we know there's a balance here, faith and, and action, faith and works. And uh, in all of Scripture, there's balance. And Lord, we want, to, we want our faith to be strong. We want it to be real, and we want it to be visible. And so, Lord, I pray that for those that raised hands, that they've identified some areas where what's seen is not lining up with who they want to be or what they say they are, that, Lord, you will help us to become all that you want us to be, like Peter, like Peter. You saw that he was going to be the rock of the church. And nobody else saw it. And he even messed up. It probably looked like, like that was out the window. But, Lord, you formed him into what you wanted him to be because he was willing to let you do that. So I pray for all of us, Lord, that you would help us, remind us that, to, to be humble enough to allow you to make the changes in our lives that you want to make. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, that, thank you that you love us that much. And thank you, Lord, you have a vision for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.